Ephesians chapter 2. I'll show you here the epistle of Paul to the Ephesians, chapter 1, chapter 2, verses 8 and 9. It says here, For by grace you are saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, for it is the gift of God, not of works, that no man glory. Huh. Faith in what? That in transubstantiation, perhaps? No, it's in the finished work of Jesus Christ on the cross. That one-time offering for sin. That's what salvation is. And you can even find it here in this corrupted Dewey Reams. Hmm. Isn't that interesting? Number six, the sixth problem that I have, the reason that a Christian cannot celebrate the Mass. Jesus Christ said it is finished on the cross and not at the Last Supper. Now that is what the reading I am familiar with in the King James Bible. He says it is finished. When he dies, right before he dies on the cross, he says it is finished. But I'm going to show you what the, how the uh, Dewey Reams renders this particular passage. Let's go back to the book of John. John chapter 19. Okay, we have Gospel of St. John. This is 19, verse 30. Jesus, therefore, when he had taken the vinegar, said, It is consummate, and bowing his head, he gave up the ghost. Okay, now they say it is consummate. And you say, well, what does that mean? Maybe that means it's just He's, he's brought in the Eucharistic sacrifice, you know, that you're re-sacrificing him, and it's just like the sacrifice of the cross. Uh, let's, let's look at the definition of consummate. Webster's 1828 Dictionary. Consummate. To end, to finish, by completing what was intended to perfect, to bring or carry to the utmost point or degree. He has a mind to consummate the happiness of the day. Another definition of consummate. Complete, perfect, carried to the utmost extent or degree as consummate greatness or felicity. So then according to the Dewey Reams, Jesus says his death on the cross is consummate, perfect, needs nothing else. Do you see the contradiction between your traditions, the man-made writings here, and your own Bible? Do you see the contradictions? They are there. How do you reconcile this stuff? The Catholic Church is the one true church, the, the true interpreters of Scripture. Why can't they figure this stuff out? I mean, Jesus dies on the cross and he says, it is consummate, finished. His sacrifice was one offering for sin. Why then must he be re-sacrificed over and over and over and over again? Why the continual system of works? What's this all about? And again, Jesus Christ had offered that breaking of bread and wine at the Last Supper. Why did he go to the cross? Doesn't make any sense. Look at John chapter 13. Back here to John chapter 13, verses 30 and 31. Okay, I'll show you here quick. John chapter 13, verses 30 and 31. He therefore, having received the morsel and continent, went forth, and it was night. When he therefore was gone forth, Jesus said, Now the Son of Man is glorified, and God is glorified in him. Okay, here you have Judas Iscariot. Right there, Judas. And basically, he is going to betray, or he does betray Jesus at this point, and he goes and he leaves the Last Supper. So, the next couple of chapters, up to chapter 18, Jesus is telling them, and he's instructing them what's going to happen. All right. So, this is officially right here, this passage, John chapter 13, verses 30 and 31. This is where officially that Last Supper ends. Okay. So, why didn't he say it's finished at that point? Or it is consummate? Because it wasn't, salvation wasn't complete until Jesus died on the cross. 
That's the salvation there. That's what's going on. Okay? It's so important to understand that. Now, the seventh reason that you have to reject the Mass, if you are a true Christian, is the dying thief was saved without ever partaking of bread and wine. You say, can you prove that? Absolutely. Luke chapter 23. Let's go back to the book of Luke. What are we at here? Chapter 23. You can see here chapter 23, the Gospel of St. Luke. We're going to go down here to the very bottom of the page. I have to move things here a little bit. Okay, we'll start here at verse 39. And one of those thieves that were hanged blasphemed him, saying, If thou be Christ, save thyself and us. But the other answering rebuked him, saying, Neither dost thou fear God, where, where thou art in the same damnation. Uh, but in, we indeed justly, for we receive worthy of our doings, but this man hath done no evil. And he said to Jesus, Lord, remember me when thou shalt come into thy kingdom. What did Jesus reply? And Jesus said to him, If you take the mass and eat of the bread and wine, then you will possibly be saved after purgatory. He doesn't say that. He says, Amen, I say to thee, this day thou shalt be with me in paradise. Without partaking of the bread and wine. No uh, last rites, extreme unction. It's not there. Faith. Belief. And notice his repentant state. His broken state saying, I deserve this death. He knew he was a thief. He knew that he deserved to die and go to hell. But he looked at Jesus and he said, remember me. Lord, remember me. He knew who Jesus was. He knew he was God manifest in the flesh. The other guy was questioning, if you're really God, you know, come down and save us. You know, get off the cross and save us too. That guy was only worried about saving his life. The other man knew, I'm dying, I deserve to die, but I don't want to go to hell. It was an act of faith. No mass, Eucharist, or transubstantiation was involved with that man's salvation. Hmm. Number eight, the eighth reason that you need to reject the Mass. No one in the book of Acts was saved by drinking wine or eating bread. Let's go to Acts chapter 2 in the Dewey Reams here. And we're going to see what the Holy Apostle Peter, you know, the first Pope, according to Catholic doctrine. Acts chapter 2, we're going to see about what Peter preached here you have Acts of the Apostles, down here, chapter 2. Again, there you have annotations for chapter 2, but we're going to go to um, verse 36 through 41. Therefore let all the house of Israel know most certainly that God hath made him both Lord and Christ, this Jesus whom you have crucified. And hearing these things, they were compunct in heart and said to Peter and to the rest of the apostles, What shall we do, men, brethren? But Peter said to them, Do penance, which King James Bible errors would say repent, which is a better reading, but do penance and be every one of you baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for remission of your your sins and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost for to you is the promise and to your children and to all that are far off whomsoever the Lord our God shall call with very many other words also did he testify and exhorted them saying save yourselves from this perverse generation uh, they therefore that received his word were baptized and they were added to that day added in that day about 3,000 souls was there any mass there no. No. It wasn't there. Hmm. Again, we see belief. 
Interesting. The first pope, uh, I guess, wasn't very good Catholic. The ninth reason why you must reject the Mass, if you are a Christian, is none of the disciples partook of the literal flesh and blood of Jesus when he was physically present on the earth. Let's go to Matthew chapter 26. Matthew chapter 26. Matthew 26. I'll show you again in the Gospel of St. Matthew chapter 26. We're going to go to verse 26 here and 20 through 28. And whilst they were at supper, Jesus took bread and blessed and break and gave to his disciples and said, Take ye and eat, this is my body. And taking the chalice, he gave thanks and gave it to them, saying, Drink ye all of this, uh, for this is my blood of the New Testament, which shall be shed for many unto remission of sins. Okay? Now, the point I'm trying to make here is if he's turning blood or bread and and wine into his literal flesh and blood, first of all, Jesus would be contradicting scripture because the Bible says before the law, under the law, after the law, Genesis, Leviticus, and Acts, it says you're not to eat blood. You know, raw flesh with the blood still in it, you're not supposed to eat that. So Jesus would be sinning here if he was actually doing transubstantiation and turning that bread and wine into his flesh and blood. But also, if he's doing that for salvation, his flesh and his blood is right there. I mean, why didn't he just say, okay, everybody gather around, just take a good bite out of my arm here and drink the blood. Does, uh, anybody want to come up and get my neck? You know, be a good vampire here, you know, and, and get some blood out of there. Why didn't he say that? Because Jesus was obviously speaking symbolically. And that Last Supper there had nothing to do with salvation. He was showing them the death that he was going to have to die. It did not mean, okay, now you're saved because you've taken the first Mass or something. No. Don't fall for that. The tenth reason that you have to reject the Mass if you are a Christian is... If the priest is supposed to be another Christ, then why does he have to offer Christ on the altar? Again, another problem for you where your teachings, your traditions are contradicting Scripture. Let me show you here. New St. Joseph Baltimore Catechism, page number 364. You say, well, I don't know about this thing of a priest being another Christ. That's kind of weird, isn't it? Well, let me show you. Again, we have here the Mass, Our Sacrifice. How about that picture? What we see, there you have the priest, what we should think of. So again, we're back to the same problem. If the priest is Christ, and, in, and he's turning the host into the literal flesh and blood of Christ, why doesn't he just offer himself? I mean, why not just have a real human sacrifice? Offer up a priest every week. You know, that might actually be a good solution, you know. And, you know, one's a pedophile, just have all the Catholics eat his flesh and drink his blood. Sacrifice him. You say, oh, come on, that's disgusting. Why would you even say a thing? They're teaching right here, right there. You can see it again. The priest is Jesus. Let's go back here to the back. Page 259, let's look at this. The ordained priest takes the place of Christ. There you go. So next time you're at Mass, you got a golden opportunity. Just go on up and take a bite out of the priest and drink his blood a little bit. And you're set. While he's in his official robes and his official, you know, thing and all that. Sure. Number 11. The 11th reason that you have to reject the Mass if you are a Christian, and that is when you partake of the Mass and you have the wafer in you and the, the wine is in you, what happens when it dissolves, when it's absorbed? Because in Hebrews chapter 10, 
right here in the Dewey Reams, Hebrews chapter 10, it said it's one offering. So if the Mass is salvation, according to Scripture, sacred Scripture here, you should only ever have to take that one time. But what happens when it dissolves? Let me show you something interesting here in the New St. Joseph Baltimore Catechism, number 374. Three seventy four. Okay, we have here, what should we do after Holy Communion? After Holy Communion, we should spend some time adoring our Lord, thanking, thanking Him, renewing our promises of love and of obedience to Him, asking Him for blessings for ourselves and others. The 15 or 20 minutes that our Lord is in us bodily after Communion, communion is the best time of the whole day for prayer. So in other words, they're even admitting to it here in the Catechism that Jesus only is in you, really, truly, for 15 to 20 minutes. Then he goes away. Well, yeah, he's dissolved. Hmm. It's kind of weird, isn't it? And uh, <clears throat> there's a thing called a communion pattern. Now, this is also very interesting. They, they don't do this all the time, but uh, you can see pictures of it here. I'll put up a picture of uh, uh, Benedict, actually, using this. You know, he's putting a, a wafer in this, this nun's mouth, as you can see here. And uh, they have this little plate underneath her mouth. And, you know, it's there just in case the wafer falls. Um, hmm, that's interesting. And, you know, why is there this fear of dropping this wafer? Kind of a strange God you have there. But an uh, interesting thing here I found on this Catholic forum. Let me show you this quick here. This guy says, uh, T700. This is a Catholic.com. The forum's here. He says, Consecra Consecrated host dropped. While waiting to go forward to receive communion today, I saw a man attempt to receive in the hand. Not sure the exact mechanism, but the consecrated host fell to the floor. The communicant simply pushed it aside with his shoe, scooped it up, and consumed it. There was no reaction from the EMHC, and people proceeded to walk right across where our Lord fell. To say I was stunned is an understatement. Even in the Anglican church from which I came, this would have caused all movement to stop the priest or deacon would have gathered up the fallen host and any visible particles covered the area with a cloth and after the Mass thoroughly uh, and reverently cleaned the spot. Having converted this Easter past, I am still in RCIA until Pentecost. I asked the instructors about this and they agreed that it was unfortunate, but they saw no real problem with the handling of it. My heart still breaks for it, even the unintentional desecration of our Lord it has certainly reaffirmed my decision to only receive on the tongue. I simply don't want to increase, however slightly, the chance of something like that happening on my watch. My question to my brothers and sisters, with more experience in the faith, what should have I done? Anything? Should I speak to the pastor about this? Do nothing but pray? Paul, former Anglican who swam the Tiber Easter 2010. Now, I'm going to try to say this with all Christian charity. That is a bunch of ridiculous nonsense, okay? Our Lord? You mean to tell me the God of heaven and earth is in a little wafer and it drops to the floor and everybody goes, oh, oh, oh. And what he said there, pick it up reverently and pick up any of the crumbs and then put a cloth there because that's where your Lord fell. Huh? Where's this at in Scripture? This is absurd to the highest degree. I mean, even when Jesus died on the cross, did the disciples come over and, and get up all the little pieces of blood and, and when he was whipped there in the judgment hall and his flesh was being ripped out and they tore out his beard, did the disciples come over and say, let's pick up all the little pieces of his flesh and his, and his beard hairs and, and everything about him. What is this? This is pagan this is pagan superstition. Absolutely absurd. I mean, if you're a Roman Catholic and you're still watching this, 
Do you mean to tell me that your God is a helpless cookie? Brown wafer? Is that really your God? It's not my God. The twelfth reason why you have to reject the Mass if you are a Christian, a real Christian, is why does the Mass ceremony mirror the ancient pagan Egyptian system practiced by Baal worshippers? So I'm going to need to see some proof of that. Okay, right there. The Two Babylons by Alexander Hislop. We're going to read here, page 160, and this is a very, very well-documented book. What could have induced the papacy to insist so much on the roundness of its unbloody sacrifice? Clearly not any reference to the divine institution of the Supper of our Lord, for in all the accounts that are given of it, no reference whatever is made to the form of bread which our Lord took when he blessed and brake it, and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take, eat, this is my body, this do in remembrance of me. As little can, be, can it be taken from any regard to injunctions about the form of the Jewish Paschal bread, for no injunctions on that subject are given in the book of Moses. The importance, however, which Rome attaches to the roundness of the wafer must have a reason, and that reason will be found if we look at the altars of Egypt. Okay, let me just stop there for a minute. Most accounts of the Last Supper that you will ever read, he's breaking bread. Now, when you break bread, it's a loaf of bread, and you rip a piece off of it. When you rip the piece off of it, it doesn't become a perfectly round wafer. So what's the deal with the round wafer? I remember I was on a, a forum the one time and I asked a bunch of Catholics that. I said, why is it a round wafer? And they were, oh, it's ridiculous. Who cares what the shape is? It doesn't matter. Oh, it matters very much. It matters very much about the shape of this wafer. Let's continue reading here. The thinned round cake, says Wilkinson, occurs on all altars. Almost every jot or tittle in the Egyptian worship had a symbolic meaning. The round disc, so frequent in the sacred emblems of Egypt, symbolized the sun. Now when Osiris, the sun uh, divinity, became incarnate and was born, it was not merely that he should give his life as a sacrifice for men, but that he might also be the life and nourishment of the souls of men. It is universally admitted that Isis was the original of the Greek and Roman Sirius, but Sirius, be it observed, was worshipped not simply as the discoverer of corn, she was worshipped as the mother of corn. The child she brought forth was he Siri, the seed, or as he was most frequently called in Assyria, Bar, which signifies at once the sun and the corn. And it talks about there in figure 37. You can see what these ancient pagan Egyptian round disc wafers would look like. Okay, some of the symbols and things there. Very interesting. And there are actually old depictions of Mary I've seen where she is a blonde-haired woman with a robe on, like a kind of a dress or whatever on, and it has ears of corn on it. Hmm. She's not the Mary of the Bible. But let's continue here. Page... 163. From all this, it is manifest that the image of the sun above or on the altar was one of the recognized symbols of those who worshipped Baal or the sun. And here in a so-called Christian church, he's referring to the Catholics there, a brilliant plate of silver in the form of a sun is so placed on the altar that everyone who adores at that altar must bow down in lowly reverence before that image of the sun. Once I ask, could that have come but from the ancient sun worship or the worship of Baal? And when the water, or what, excuse me, when the wafer is so placed that the silver sun is fronting the round wafer, whose roundness is so important an element in the Romish mystery, what can be the meaning of it but just to show to those who have eyes to see that the wafer itself is only another symbol of Baal or the sun? Hmm. And you say, well, you know, I, I never heard of anything so ridiculous. Well, here's two pictures of Pope Francis. First of all, you have this picture here where he is holding up the round wafer. And what these guys do, you watch it, watch it in the mass. They will take that round wafer and they slowly elevate it. Why? You say, well, it's, it's so that the faithful can adore the consecrated host. 
uh, that's what they tell you. That's for the, uh, you know, the novices. But in reality, the real truth is, it's the elevation of the sun. They're worshiping the sun god. Baal, that's what they're doing. They're ancient Baal worship. That's what this thing is. Lucifer, and you, you do all the study, do all the research, it goes back to Lucifer, worshiping Satan. That's what this whole system is. And when they take that consecrated wafer and they put it inside the big silver or gold monstrance, again, here's a picture of this, Pope Francis looking at the wafer in the monstrance, then it becomes the sun god, the solar deity. All the rays going outward like that. What is it? It is the ancient system of Baal worship, sun worshipers. That is what Catholicism is. It is not biblical Christianity. That's why this teaching is not found in Scripture. That's why they had to come up with all of, all of their traditions to overthrow sacred Scripture. But let's continue here. Page 164 it says here, There are letters on the wafer that are worth reading. These letters are IHS. What mean these mystical letters? To a Christian, these letters are represented as signifying Jesus hominem salvator, Jesus the Savior of men. That's what you're told if you're a Catholic. That's what they'll say it means. But let a Roman worshiper of Isis, for in the age of the emperors that they were there were inseparable, um, excuse me, innumerable worshippers of Isis in Rome. Cast his eyes upon them, and how will he read them? He will read them, of course, according to his own well-known system of idolatry, Isis, Horus, Zeb. That is the mother, the child, and the father of the gods. In other words, the Egyptian Trinity. Can the reader imagine that this double sense is accidental? Surely not. And of course, it isn't. But you see, all things in the occult have two meanings. One for the masses, you know, the masses that go to the masses, you know. One for the masses, one for the initiated. So you get the higher levels, they're saying, we worship, we worship Lucifer. And the people go, wait a second, Lucifer is Satan, isn't it? And you go, oh, no, 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 it's the morning star. We uh, worship Jesus. Uh-huh. And inwardly they're saying, no, we worship Satan. That's what they do. Oh, and the uh, round wafer, that's the communion host. That's what was going on there in the Bible. That's what they tell you. But inwardly, behind the scenes, they're saying, no, actually, it's the sun god, the solar disk, Isis, Horus, Zeb, the Egyptian trinity, Baal worship, that whole system that's condemned back there in the Old Testament. That's why you have to reject it if you're a Christian. Let's go to the New St. Joseph Baltimore Catechism again, page 106. Show you something else. I like this one too. Here we have page 106, the first commandment of God. He commands worship of God and forbids false worship. And what do they show? They show the priest carrying the monstrance, the ancient Baal system. And they're saying, this is the worship of God. That's your God there. The wafer in this sun ray disk system. But false worship is, you know, crystal ball there. That's false worship. Oh, no, that's called divination. That's not actually worship. It's divination. Trying to determine the future based on these pagan ways. But, you know, look down here. It says, this is wrong. You know, Buddha is God, money is God, science is God, public opinion is God. That's all wrong, but a worship of God, this is right. Baal worship is right. The rest are wrong. Yeah, sure, right. And you say, well, I don't agree. You know, I, it's the consecrated host. It's Jesus. You know, it's, it's in there. It, it, you're just, you're, you're crazy. Well, let's look about this. Acts chapter 17 does your Dewey Reams Bible actually condemn this thing of worshiping an image? Acts, here you go, the Acts of the Apostles, chapter 17 and verse 29. Being therefore of gold's 
of God's kind, we may not suppose the divinity to, be, divinity to be like unto gold or silver or stone, the graving of art and device of man. We may not suppose the divinity to be graven, a graven image made by man, the device of man, gold and silver. You mean like the monstrance? Condemned in the uh, Roman Catholic Church's own version? Hmm. Finally, the 13th reason that I and any other Christian has to reject the Mass, and that is the question I have for you if you're a Catholic. Does the Mass give assurance of salvation? You say, well, we're not supposed to have assurance of salvation. Well, maybe according to your uh, traditions. But let's see what your Bible says. 1 John chapter 5. 1 John chapter 5. Okay. There, finally. Okay, we have chapter 5 and verse 13. These things I write to you that you may know that you have eternal life, which believe in the name of the Son of God. So then according to the Dewey Reams Bible here, you can know that you have eternal life. Um, because you've taken the Mass and you've been faithful and you've not committed, you know, you've committed some venial sins, but never any mortal sins, and, and you've stayed in confession and you've come to... No. Believed in the name of the Son of God. How do you reconcile that with this? Hmm? Doesn't work too good, does it? Let's look at the... Uh, Catechism here again, number 377. It says here, why is it well to receive Holy Communion often, even daily? Remember what we read back there in Hebrews chapter 10? About the priest standing and offering the same sacrifices every day, which can never take away sins? Hmm. It is well to receive Holy Communion often, even daily, because this intimate union with Jesus Christ, the source of all holiness and the giver of all graces, is the greatest aid to a holy life. There you have the priest. You know, you're supposed to think he's Jesus again. And it says about weekly communion and daily communion. You should go and have this thing every day. Then why does it say it's once? Why did Jesus say there when he died on the cross, it is consummate, perfect, finished, complete. That's what consummate means. Why? How can you reconcile that? Oh, show you one other thing here quickly. You say, well, uh, you know, I just think that, that uh, we're complete as, as Catholics and we have the one true path to heaven and everything. Well, if uh, you can know that you have eternal life, then why do you need this place called purgatory? Number 184. Who are punished in purgatory? Those are punished for a time in purgatory who die in the state of grace but are guilty of venial sin or have not fully satisfied for the temporal punishment due to their sins. Purgatory is God's hospital. Uh, it says here, Purgatory is God's hospital for souls where those who do not love God enough to enter heaven are cured by fire. That's a nice thing to look forward to. And, uh, you know, Nobody's without sin. You all sin. All have sinned. So, according to that, if you're a good Catholic, you're going to have to burn for a while after you die. What a wonderful promise. You say, well, that's what the Bible teaches, though. You know, I, I, I just, that's what the Holy Scripture teaches. Really? The first epistle of John the Apostle, 
chapter 1, verse 7. But if we walk in the light as he also is in the light, we have society one toward another, and the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanseth us from some sin. No, actually it says uh, all sin. The blood of Jesus Christ, according to the Dewey Reams, the blood of Jesus Christ, God's Son, cleanseth from all sin. You mean the blood that you drink? Oh, that's right. That's condemned in Scripture. You can't drink blood. So where's this blood applied? It's applied at the cross. The one-time offering for sin, where it was consummate, according to the Dewey Reams. I didn't even read from this uh, Protestant, you know, quote-unquote Bible. This is the real one, by the way. But even the Dewey Reams right here does not teach, does not support this over here. And by the way, let me just, let me show you here again. Let me show you the little comparison here. You have this one, you have this one. And you have that one and that one. Three volumes of Old Testament, one volume of New Testament. Right there. And you have one King James Bible. Why is there such a difference between the two? You know why? Because this text here, you believe it as you read it. This one here, when you read it, it has to be explained away. That's why there's so many notes in it. That's why the Catholic Church says, uh, no, sacred scripture is not enough. You need a divine tradition. Official statements. Canon and decrees of the Council of Trent. You see? That's why I reject the Mass. But I'm going to show you one more verse here, and then we'll be done. From the Dewey Reams. In the book of Romans, chapter 4. Romans chapter 4, verses. You see the epistle of St. Paul to the Romans, chapter 4, verses 6 through 8. As David also termeth the blessedness of a man to whom God reputeth justice without works. Blessed are they whose iniquities be forgiven and whose sins be covered. Blessed is the man to whom our Lord hath not imputed sin. Have you received that blessing from God? How do you have your sins taken away? The mass can't do it. Hebrews chapter 10, here in the Dewey Reams, said that that priest that stands up there and offers the same sacrifice to take away sins, it never takes them away. How do you have your sins forgiven? Repentance toward God. Knowing that you are a sinner. Realizing like that thief that died on the cross, I am worthy of this death. He didn't say, get me off of here, I don't deserve this. He said, I'm here Justly, I am here dying and I deserve to die. But, Lord, remember me when thou comest into thy kingdom. Remember me. Do you want to go to heaven when you die or do you want to go to hell? So I think I'm going to take my chances with purgatory. Uh, there is no purgatory in the Bible. It's not there. What you need to do is you need to come to God as a sinner and realize you have no chance of being good enough. And all the good works and everything else, that's never going to get you into heaven. Not going to happen. According to the Dewey Reams. And what you need to realize is your salvation must come by put you putting your faith in what Jesus Christ did on the cross to pay for your sins. And that blood that he shed on the cross, it's applied to you externally. You don't drink it. Because if you drink it, you're violating scripture. You see? See how that thing works? It's applied to you. It washes your sins away. And all of your sins are forgiven. 
not of works. Not of your works. You don't have to work your way to heaven. You know, it's a blessed thing to be able to say, God's not going to impute my sins to me. Why? Because Jesus Christ, His death on the cross, that blood that was shed there on the cross, washed all my sins away. Now in God's sight, I have a perfect record. Doesn't mean He won't punish me if I sin. God will punish me. He'll chasten me as one of His sons. But He's not going to send me to hell. I don't have to worry about that. If you want to be a Christian, a real one, you need to reject all this junk over here, this junk right here. You need to get a King James Bible. It's, it's, this isn't some kind of a Protestant Bible or whatever. This thing here condemns a lot of the Protestants. Okay, You can check out my other videos and see that I'm in trouble with a lot of the uh, brethren, the Protestants. A lot of Protestants hate me just as much as devout Roman Catholics. Okay, True Bible-believing Christians do not fall under denominational names. All right? We don't have names. I'm just a Christian. A member of the body of Christ. That's all I am. I'm not an independent fundamental Baptist or a Methodist or a Presbyterian or Lutheran or whatever. No, I don't follow men. I follow the teachings of this Word of God right here, the Bible. That's it. And if you want to see what true salvation is according to the pages of the King James Bible where I take you through and I show you not my opinions but what the Scripture says. You can click on this salvation message. I'm going to put it up here. Click on it. Watch it. All right. It's so very important. Understand the danger that you are in as a Catholic. Understand that your system goes way back to Babylon, to Egypt, the ancient Baal worship system. You cannot continue in that. And I have showed you in this study that your church traditions contradict your sacred scripture. And this was just, this was a minor study. I mean, we could have gone into so many more details, so many more scriptures from here and from other Catholic versions and things like that. We could have gone through this thing. We could spend hours and hours and hours on it. I just wanted to cover the main points of this. You cannot be saved and be a Roman Catholic. It's just as simple as that. You need to come out of that system. Get out of it. So that will be it for this video. I thank you for watching, and I do pray if you are a Catholic that you will seriously consider these things.